help if I had the, so I, I had the belt pack on, but didn't have the, uh, the mic switch on, so uh, 10 minutes of the silent video, so we'll, we'll, we'll keep the video up. Sorry about that for those that are joining us on our YouTube channel. Um, but, uh, all right, so let's get into an outline. So, uh, you know, the, the letter's short enough where we, we, we could probably read through it uh, all at one setting uh, this morning. I don't know if I'm going to do that or not, but I'm going to give you an outline that we're going to follow uh, as we study the book in more detail. So, it begins with an, it should be on that handout. I had it on that, out, that uh, handout. But uh, all right, so the first part is an apostolic greeting. And we see this, uh, and this is verses one and two. Um, and we're going we're, we're gonna to talk about this in more detail. We're not right now just for the outline, but uh, we're just going to give you a, sort of a bullet point uh, structure of the, of the letter. So it starts with an apostolic greeting. This is quite common in the day, even not just in letters to churches, but in general um, when when letters that are sent, even secular letters, there's a greeting. And it's oftentimes a ritualized greeting. But then uh, as we get the next section of the, of the letter is going to be an exhortation to godliness. And this is from uh, chapter 1, verse 3 to 21. So an exhortation is simply uh, you're, you're urging somebody, you're, you're, you know, Peter's urging his recipients to live a life of godliness. Okay? Um, and, and why would, again, why would he do that? Well, because they're not, right? Or they're being influenced to not live that way. Um, so th now we're going to break this down into a couple of parts. So there's the part A is the content of the exhortation, which is chapter, uh, verse 3 to verse 11. And then uh, he, he provides uh, a rationale for why it's necessary to, for them to hear this again. And that's in verses 12 to 15. And then in uh, the final section of this uh, part of the outline is uh, he gives a certain basis of the exhortation and the revelation of Christ and scripture. And we're just looking at this in the big picture before we uh, start in, into the text uh, in more detail. So that's verses 16 to 21. So he greets them and he starts with an exhortation to live godly lives. And, and then uh, that's broken up a little bit there for us. And now we're going to move to the next part. So the next part is a warning against false teachers. And this is found in chapter 2, verses 1 to 22. And it's also broken down in a, a couple of ways. Is, um, he starts with why, a rationale for why you would anticipate false teachers in verses 1 to 3. And then uh, he goes into that uh, God delivers the righteous uh, section of this portion uh, of the outline how God delivers the righteous and punishes the ungodly, and this is found in verses 4 to 10a. And then part C is a denunciation of the motives, character, and message of the false teachers, and this is the rest of the chapter, so from verse 10b through 22. And I'm going to break that part down a little more when we get into more detail, but for right now, that's we're, we're just doing a big picture. And then part four of the outline is answers to skepticism regarding the end of the world. Now remember that we learned from the purpose of the letter, we saw in the purpose of the letter that they believed that there wouldn't be a final judgment, right? So this is when he's starting to get to that section of it, and this is chapter three, verses one to 10. And then uh, there's the final exhortation on the basis of Christian expectation and hope, uh, chapter three, verses 11 to 18. So I think what I'm gonna do uh, because I, I, I find it helpful at times. You know, oftentimes when we're doing a Bible study, we just kind of dive right in and start looking at uh, um, uh, things in detail. Uh, when In certain books of the Bible, you can't, you, you can't read through in one setting like Isaiah, right, 66 chapters. Uh, it would take us a couple weeks to read through the book of Isaiah, and most of us would probably have forgotten what we heard the first week by the time we got to the end of the book. But this is short enough uh, this letter is short enough where we can read through it, and I, I'm going to I'm going to put it, I'm going to uh, describe it this way. We're we're going to look at the forest before we start looking at the leaves on the trees. Okay, 
Um, and so uh, just to give you a, a, a big picture, uh, we're going to read through the book uh, this morning, so, uh, and, and then we'll start our study. So Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, May grief, may, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may be, become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure, for if you practice these qualities, you will never uh, fall. For in this way, there will, be, uh, there will be richly uh, provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth uh, that you have, I think it right as long as I am in this body to stir you up by way of reminder since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths uh, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was uh, born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have something more sure, the prophetic word, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. But false prophets also rose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will uh, secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themself, themselves swift destruction. A and many will follow their sensuality, and because of the uh, and, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation uh, from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he res rescued righteous Lot, uh, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials 
and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord, but these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage of their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of uh, Balaam, the son of Beor, <coughs> who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. From them, the gloom of utter darkness has been restored, reserved. Uh, for, for speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by uh, sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to, to, to that he is enslaved. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world, through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to be turned back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring, you, uh, stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately <clears throat> overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water, by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that, that then existed was deluged, deluged with water and perished. <clears throat> but by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? I, I think I skipped a part of my outline, didn't I? No, no, I didn't finish that. So, uh, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved... <clears throat> Since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction. 
as they do other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. All right, so uh, now let's jump back to the beginning. So we, ju we just heard the entire book, right? Um, it, it, it doesn't take that long to read. It was, that was about 10 minutes, maybe, uh, reading slowly and uh, trying to enunciate everything. <clears throat> and so now what we're going to do is we're going to go in and start uh, looking at it in greater detail. And I think this is still on the handout that you have, right? Um, okay. Yes, because I got a black, a black slide in there. All right, um, so the apostolic greeting. So greet uh, Simeon, Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have attained a faith equal of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord. Okay, so we've already talked about the Simeon. So, uh, for, so remember that Simon is a Hellenized, a Greco-Roman version of Simeon. So you'll remember when Jesus was presented in the temple, there was that guy named Simeon, right? The song of Simeon, the Nook Dementis, that we sing as part of our worship services, right? Um, so Simeon would be the Hebrew equivalent of, of Simon, or, or vice versa, Simon would be the uh, uh, Greco-Roman version of Simeon, right? So we, we, and we talked about that earlier when we when we dealt with the uh, introductory stuff um, on, on the book. So what we're going to do now is we're going to, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question. How does Peter refer to himself in verse 1a, right? A servant and an apostle. So the first thing that he says is a servant um, of, and, and you would, so a servant of Jesus Christ, and an apostle of Jesus Christ. So the Jesus Christ goes with both, right? Um, and so uh, th this, the English word servant comes from a Greek word, it's doulos, um, which could be translated not just as servant, but also as slave. So every time you see in, in the New Testament, when, when Paul says a servant of Jesus Christ, you could also think a slave of Jesus Christ. And, and and, and this, this is important, well, well I, think it's, I think it's important, right? Uh, it, not, not, but, well, we're gonna, what, what might that imply? When, when Peter here and, and Paul in his letter says a, a servant or a slave of Jesus Christ, what might that um, imply? So who is a slave supposed to obey? Their master. So a slave is to be obedient to their master and to do what the master tells them, right? So I tell my cat to let me sleep in my bed, but he never listens, right? Um, he had me up at 2.30 last night, uh, out, on, uh, out to the couch I went, right? Um, and then he was trying to wake me up at 3 o'clock to get up out of bed, <laughs> uh, off the couch, that is. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, you know, so the cat doesn't listen to me. He doesn't obey me. Well, <laughs> well he, 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 he thinks he's the master, right? <laughs> right? But, but, but in this context of, the, of this, this greeting, uh, when uh, the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul uh, writes this servant or slave of Jesus Christ, I, I think that tells us, it, it informs us um, as we understand it as also as a slave, what that fully entails is that Paul and Peter are not taking what they have, right? They're giving what their master has told them to give, right? So the words that they're writing, as we'll see also with the title of apostle here in a moment, but, but they're being obedient to their savior, Jesus Christ, in all that he has given them to do. Right, um, and so now not every slave, right, from a human perspective, not every slave is uh, fully obedient to their master, right. But in this context of of the of the of the, uh, of the narrative of Scripture in the New Testament, I, I I believe that 
they are, right? So they're, they're taking what their master has given them to, to, to receive and to also give to the people. Um, and so I, 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 like, I like to remind people that the servant, right? Because oftentimes when we think of, of serving someone, what do we think of? Doing something for someone else, right? Um, and so when you go out to a restaurant, you have a what? A server, right? The, the person who's going to serve you while you're at the restaurant. Uh, but, but, but notice that once you leave the restaurant, what happens? They don't come home with you to keep serving you, right? It's only during that time that you're there that they, they serve you in that, in that way. But a slave, right, a slave being obedient to their master, that, that goes beyond just the, 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 that one little context. Right, um, all right, and maybe I'm belaboring that too much. I don't know, uh, but uh, so he first refers to himself as a a servant of Jesus Christ or a slave of Jesus Christ, and then he also refers to himself as an apostle. And so the the English word apostle comes from a Greek word apostolos, uh, which could be translated as a sent one. So again, one who's sent does what? Well, does the bidding of the one who is sending them, right? So, you know, in our modern day world, ambassadors are, are kind of sent ones, right? So we send ambassadors to the United States, not we, but the United States of America sends ambassadors to other countries to represent whose interests? Well, not their own interests, at least it's not supposed to be that way, uh, but the, 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 uh, the interests of the United States of America in that place, right? Um, so, uh, and, and you know that elsewhere in the New Testament, in the Gospel accounts, that uh, Jesus refers to them as the apostles. So when does Jesus send out the apostles? Well, that might be a tricky question. It's not meant to be a tricky question. Uh, but uh, so he sends them out during the, his earthly ministry, but then he sends them out after he's been crucified and risen from the dead. Right? So the so-called Great Commission at the end of uh, Matthew uh, there's another commissioning and sending at the end of Luke, right, um, where Jesus tells them to go out and proclaim the good news, right, into all the earth. Luke says to preach repentance and the forgiveness of sins in Christ Jesus. Jesus tells them to go forth and make disciples of all nations in Matthew uh, and, and, uh, by, by baptizing and teaching, right? Um, and so they're, they're, they're sent out in the church, you know, to this day is still being sent out, right? You and I are carrying the good news of Jesus. We're not, we're not, we're not supposed to hoard it up for ourselves, right? And I've never watched one of those shows, but there's a bunch of shows on TV, you know, hoarders, you know, people who, who, who just collect and collect and collect and they can't even, you know, move around their house anymore, right? Um, but but this, this treasure that you and I have, which is the good news of Jesus, is not something we're to keep to ourselves, right? To, to, to hold on to it for just us. It's, it's meant to go forth into the world, and it still is going forth into the world um, through missionaries and through you and through me as we interact with people and, and uh, share the good news that we have in Christ Jesus with them. And so uh, when, when we hear this word apostle, <clears throat> we can also you know, just kind of have in mind one who's been sent. And so the one who's been sent, he, he's there again. So this couples back. It's, it's, it's sort of a, a dual uh, thing here, right? So slave obey, is obedient to their master, and the sent one is obedient to the one who sends them, right? So God has sent Peter and the other apostles out into the world. Um, okay. So he's not, again, he's not taking what is his, right? So when we, when we hear from Paul, and we hear from Peter and John and James and the writer of the sacred letter to the Hebrews, that they're not, they're not sharing their words, right? They are the ones writing the letters, but they're being led by the Holy Spirit and inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these words, to address situations and circumstances. Okay. Uh, is, uh, for those of you who have the handout, um, is Well, so in the so in the gospel accounts, um, 
there's, there is a distinction between the apostles and the disciples. Not in the sense of who's, um, who's more important, but the, the, the apostles were that group of the 12, right, who were closest to Jesus um, uh, during his earthly ministry. The disciples, you know, um, I'm going to go to the whiteboard for a minute if I can remember. So one way to think about this is to look at this as a series of circles. So Jesus is at the center, um, and, and around him, there's a, there's a subset of Peter, James, and John, right? They, they get to do certain things that none of the rest do, right? Now, don't ask me why, because I can't tell you why. It's just, that's what the scriptures tell us. And then, so this is a subset of that larger group called the, the Twelve. It's a technical title, but also uh, the Apostles. And then around them would be the Disciples. So, obviously, well, I should, maybe I'm going to say obviously. Clearly, from the testimony of Scripture, Peter, James, and John were followers of Jesus, right? So they're a disciple of Jesus. Uh, and the twelve, or the apostles, they're disciples of Jesus. But when the, when the, uh, the New Testament, uh, in the Gospel accounts, talks about disciples, it's, the, it's those that are following Jesus, but not real close, if that makes sense. So when he commissions, uh, when, he, when he speaks the... the the, what we refer, often refer to as the Great Commission, um, it's the apostles that are there, minus Ju uh, Judas Iscariot, because he killed himself already. So it's, it's the 11 are there. And so the commissioning then is to the apostles, the sent ones. Now, on the day of Pentecost, you know, wh wh where, are, where are they? Well, they're in an upper room in Jerusalem, and it's, it's, the, it's the, the 11, They've added Matthias to their number, so they're now back at 12. And then others were there in that room. So we, we learned that, when, you know, so we, we don't want to be too uh, rigid um, in, in, uh, in this. But so the disciples are there, other disciples, are, other followers of Jesus are there on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit descends. Now, does the Holy Spirit descend on all of them gathered in that? So I think it's 120, uh, 120. 12, 24, something like that. Um, so please forgive me for not knowing the exact number in the upper room. Uh, but it's a big room. And uh, so did the Holy Spirit just descend on the apostles or on all of them? And if you look at Christian artwork, it's portrayed different ways, both ways, right? And so, but they're there when the Holy Spirit comes. And, and they're, they're now also part of this mission, right, of, of the church. Because remember that the, um, um, uh, when they select the, the seven deacons, they go out and proclaim the good news of Jesus. So it's not, it's not just restricted to the apostles themselves. Others are led by the Spirit to, to share the good news of Jesus as well. I don't know if that helps or answers. Um, and, and depending where you're at in the gospel accounts, um, and I ran out of white space on my, on my whiteboard here, but this, this is a big expandable and contractible uh, group. And the, the reason I say it's contractible is um, in, in John chapter 6, when Jesus has his, um, uh, gives the bread of life discourse, uh, there were those that stopped following Jesus because the, the things that he was teaching, this particular thing, he says, you know, eat, whoever eats my flesh will live forever, whoever drinks my blood will never thirst. And they're like, oh, that's, that's we, no. I can't, I, can't, I can't abide with that. So they stopped following him, right? Um, and, you know, the, the Christian church in America, you know, we, we, we might be in this contracting um, field here today. Um, not that it can never expand again, but, you know, just from our observation, it seems to be shrinking um, in our culture today. Um, but um, now the church will never go away, okay? Um, the church will be here when Jesus comes back. Maybe not St. Paul Lutheran Church, not, maybe not this congregation, but the Christian church, believers in Christ, will be on earth to see Jesus return. 
right? And this is the testimony of Scripture. So we, we, we never have to worry and, and, and to, to be uh, wringing our hands about the state of, of the church because God is ruling over his bride, the church. He's taking care of her. He's providing for her. He, he doesn't promise that she will necessarily be large, uh, numerically speaking, uh, but there will be faithful followers of Christ on the last day uh, to see his return. You know, maybe, maybe it's today, maybe it's tomorrow, or maybe it's some years after you and I have been called home to the Lord. Uh, but there, there will be a day, um, and it will be a glorious day, and the church will be here, the bride of Christ will be here to see his return. Whoops, wrong, wrong button, sorry. Uh, there we go. Um, all right, so, uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, so, yes, the question is, are, you know, um, I'm about to say something that usually strikes fear in the heart of people in a congregation, so I'm going to just preface it. I have not received any call papers, so don't panic, okay? But the next pastor who is called here, right, um, he, he will be installed as the pastor of this congregation and he will make certain promises uh, before you, before the congregation, and before God about what he's going to do. And, and one of which is to remain faithful and true to God's word. And this is where the departure has happened, right, in, our, in the modern day Christian church in America, in many denominations, is we're, we're no longer being true to, I mean, they say they are, but the practices belie this, right? Um, they, th what they're engaged in and doing is not in agreement with God's word or the Lutheran confession um, on, in this regard. But so I don't I don't know um, when uh, when in the Old Testament when uh, I don't I don't have the Septuagint in my brain uh, in terms of uh, what Greek word is used there when Saul is described as a servant. But he does not listen and do everything the way the Lord has told him to do. And th this is a precursor uh, to why he loses the kingship. Right in, in the end, it's, it's because he does not listen and he's not obedient to the Lord. Um, and this is, a, this is a message for, for all of us, um, I think, as Christians, that we're called to be children of God. Right? And we are children of God right, through faith and baptism, and we're called to live a life that's congruent with that. Now, the good news for you and I is that when God's word reveals to me that I have sinned, that I have not lived my life the way God had would have me live, that he, he brings me to repentance. He brings me to repentance. It's not something I do for myself. God is at work in me to bring that about, and he's at work in me to, me, to lead me to confess my sins, um, uh, whether that's corporately in our worship services or individually, privately to a, to a pastor. Um, and, and then he, he, he gives me that gift of absolution, the forgiveness, right? Uh, so I, I would say that um, I, I would say that congregations that have gone the way of the world in regard to what we're talking about, um, they might have good intentions, but they're not they're not following God's word, right? And you know I, I remember a, a word. It's my very first Bible. I've shared this story before. It's the very first Bible study. I attended at my fieldwork church when we were, I think we were in the book of Acts when we were studying this, and, and I, re, I re remember the pastor saying, uh, you know, the, the, the road to hell is paved with the skulls of pastors who had good intentions. You know, and the honorable seminarian sitting, <laughs> sitting at the table was like, eh. you know, I, 
It, it, it's a, but it's a sobering thought, right? I, we can have all the good intentions we want, but in the end, if, if, we, if, we, if we're not following God's word and straying from it um, and engaging in activities that are contrary, as we're going to see in this letter, we've already heard, and we're going to see in more detail in this letter, um, in, in Peter's letter, that um, it, it's not good. You know, it's not good. Um, because we're, we're leading people astray. I don't mean we as in this congregation. But when people do that, and when, when church bodies are doing this, they're leading people astray. And they're not preaching the truth. Um, and uh, we're going we're gonna to hear from Peter uh, what, what happens to the false teachers in his letter. Well, we've already heard it, but we're going to hear it in more detail. So I don't know if that helps or not. Um, uh, yeah, so th they might have, you know, they, they might have good intentions, uh, but good intentions are, are never enough, right? Um, we need to be true to God's word. All right. Um, so uh, now in, in verse 1b, uh, Peter identifies the recipients of this letter, and uh, what does he say about them, and what does this mean? So let's just reread that. So to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. So notice that even though Peter identifies himself as an apostle, what, what is he telling this group of people? We are equals, right? Even though he's been once sent by God to do this, they have equal standing in Christ Jesus, right? And, and this is, this is, um, this is why Paul says, you know, um, I'm pretty sure it's in Galatians, um, you know, there's, well, it says in a couple different places, but he says there's neither Jew nor Greek. Well, time out. There are Jewish people, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, and then there's all the other people, the Greeks, right? Um, but, but Paul just said there, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither male nor female. Now, by the way, it, when you got up this morning and you saw yourself in the mirror, you knew, you knew that you were either a male or a female, right? Um, and you've known that for a long time. And so when he says there's neither male nor female, he, he doesn't mean that men don't exist and women don't exist, that there's something else there, right? That's not what he's saying, as we'll get to. Uh, there, there's neither s a slave nor free, right? But, but there were slaves at that time, and there were free people at that time. And, and, and it's in the end clause that we learn there's, there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither male nor female, there's neither slave nor free in Christ Jesus. So, what's that? Yes, we, we have equal stature and standing in Christ Jesus. Now, yes, I've been called to fulfill a role in the congregation that none of you have been called to be, right, which is to be your pastor, right? Um, and so there is a distinction there. Not everybody can be a pastor. Not everybody should be a pastor, as, as uh, 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 Paul talks about in his pastoral epistles. But he does call, it is now, it, was, it wasn't at the very, it wasn't at the very first 10 minutes. Yeah, that's okay, yeah. Thank, thank them and apologize, uh, but it is, it is at about the 10 minute mark. Um, yeah. So, so now notice that, and you, you hear me say this in sermons, I hope you, I hope you hear me say this in sermons, that, that I'm a sinner just like you are. Right? And, and we, we commit sins, even your pastor. Your pastor's not holy in the sense of sinless. Your, your pastor's holy in Christ, um, but I, I still commit sins, and I'm in need of being led to repentance and confessing and receiving that absolution. I'm in need of receiving the sacrament of the altar, too. Right? Um, not every church body believes that about their, their clergy, but this is how we view and understand the clergy. So there is a distinction between Jews and Greeks, uh, uh, males and females, uh, slaves and free, uh, between the pastor and the parishioners, but we have we all have equal standing in Christ Jesus. My faith is not greater than your faith, right? In fact, there's probably times when my faith might be weaker than yours. Uh, but here Peter says, to those who have been who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours. So notice the passive have obtained. That means it's been given to them, right? God, you, you, 
you know, I, I jokingly ask people when I'm teaching uh, instruction classes, I've done it in Bible study classes as well, you know, tell me where I can go in Walmart to find faith. Give me the aisle number. Uh, you, tell me top rack, bottom rack, somewhere in the middle. You know, is it toward the left end, the right end of the aisle? No, I'm being facetious. You know, or Lowe's. Tell me, tell me the row and bin number. Uh, if, although nothing's ever in the bin that's supposed to be in, in Lowe's. At Lowe's, it seems like. But at least when I go there. Um, right? We can't go and find faith. Faith has to be given to us, and it's given to us through God's word. Right? Uh, that's what creates faith. It, it's nothing that I do, it's nothing that you do, it's the work of the Holy Spirit through the Word to change our hearts, right? to point us to the one who's won our salvation and to give us the gift that trusts in him for that salvation, apart from any work of my own. And Peter says here that they have equal standing. The faith, the faith of these Christians that he's writing to is the, the same faith that he had. Right? And they're equal in Christ. Now, he's writing a letter, though, as we heard earlier, uh, uh, where he, he does assume an authority, a position of authority. Right? Because, you know, if someone exhorts you to do something, encourages you to do something, whether or not you do it probably depends on what you think about that person, right? Um, right? So when Peter's exhorting, he's exhorting from a position of authority. But he says we're equal, we have equal standing in Christ, right? And it's, um, and it, it's ours by the righteousness of our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So God gives us the gift of faith. He gives us Christ's righteousness uh, through baptism. <clears throat> and it, it belongs to us, not that we went and got it but that God has given it to us. And so our righteousness is apart from it. And it's a good, good Lutheran theology here, right? You, you cannot earn your salvation. If you try to earn your salvation, you are cutting yourself off at the knees because you will never be good enough. But in Christ, you are perfect, right? So God gives us Christ's righteousness. In your baptism, you are clothed with Christ's righteousness, and it's now yours. Um, most of us, when we got up this morning and got dressed, we dressed ourselves, right? Um, but when we were little babies, the, the baby couldn't dress itself, right? And, and even some young children seem to have a hard time dressing themselves, right? Um, they can put the clothes on, but they might not be able to pick out the right stuff to wear. I don't know. Um, but Peter says this righteousness, we have obtained this righteousness and that's through faith and baptism. So it's become theirs, and they have equal stature um, in Christ, even though he's going to be uh, writing, he's writing to them as the authority, right? So notice at the very opening, Simeon Peter, a slave and sent one of Christ Jesus. Right? That's the authority. All right. Um, belabored that a little bit uh, about the what does this mean maybe um, but no, not, not belabored but, um, but I think we've covered that um, and then in the next part it's what uh, the, in verse 2 what blessing does Peter give them so may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord so may grace and peace um, we're going to we'll explore those in, in a minute. Be, be what? Multiplied. You, you have it, and Peter's desire is that that grace and peace would increase. Right? To, mul to multiply means to what? Well, to add to, right? Um, to add to whatever the thing is. In this case, it's, it's grace and peace. Um, and notice that it's in the knowledge. So it's going to be multiplied through what? Through knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Okay. So, again, is this an active or passive action? Well, to be multiplied means that someone else is doing the work. Right? Um, 
now I can, I can increase myself, right? In, in, um, I can increase how much weight I lift if I start lifting weights again, right? Um, and, uh, or I can do that kind of increasing. But here it says, may grace and peace be multiplied to you, which means that this is an outside agent is going to be doing this increasing and this multiplying, not themselves, right? Now, it's going to come through knowledge, right? We're going to talk about what that knowledge is. So I, I would say that this is a passive action, right? It's, it's not that they're going out to do this. Uh, the Holy Spirit is going to be doing this in their lives to increase this grace and, and peace in their lives uh, um, through God, through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And then, uh, so how should we understand knowledge? Well, what does this entail? So I'm going to read a quote uh, from, from Luther uh, about th this knowledge that he's referring to, is, it, that Peter is referring to, is not factual knowledge about knowing your history and your dates. Okay? It's about what we might refer to as heart knowledge. Okay? There's head knowledge, and then there's heart knowledge. Right? Um, knowing facts about Jesus does not save you. Trusting in Jesus through faith, that's what saves you. And so he, Luther has a, a, a little bit of a lengthy quote here um, that uh, related to this, uh, on this issue of knowledge. But, but the fact that you, like the Turks, the Jews, and the devil, believe that God created all things, this is not the knowledge of God. So... Uh, Turks, this would be uh, Muslims, right? Uh, so those that follow is, is the religion of Islam. And they believe that Allah created the universe, right? But they, they don't have that same knowledge that you and I have of God and Christ, right? Because they don't believe in him. Uh, neither do the, the Jews believe that, uh, the, the, those that practice Judaism believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Nor is this knowledge your belief that Christ was born from a virgin, suffered, died, and rose again. No, you have the true knowledge of God when you believe and know that God and Christ are your God and your Christ. This the devil and the false Christians cannot believe. Thus, this knowledge is nothing else than the true Christian faith. For when you know God and Christ in this way, you will rely on him with all your heart and trust in him in good fortune and misfortune in life and death. To have God is to have all grace, all mercy, and everything one can call good. To have Christ is to have the Savior and the and mediator who brought us to the point that God belongs to us and who acquired for us all mercy from him. You must weave this together in such a way that Christ becomes yours and you become his, then you have a true knowledge. Right, so this knowledge that Peter's talking about is growing in faith, right, trusting in God and his promises fulfilled in Christ Jesus. And that faith can grow. Right? We have it right, because God has given it to us, but that faith can also grow. Right? So grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and our Savior Christ Jesus, or of Jesus our Lord. Rather. I'm sorry, I picked up. Uh, Verse one. Um, all right, we're going to stop there. Um, and I, no, yeah, yeah, we'll stop there. Um, and we'll pick up next time with our, our current outline. And all right, we'd like to thank those that joined us via our YouTube channel. We uh, hope you can join us at some point in the near future. But until that day comes, uh, please continue to join us uh, virtually. And um, same YouTube channel. Don't forget our worship service starts in about 15 minutes. Same uh, YouTube channel, different camera orientation. Um, but that's it for now.